man go, what, go may, what may, anywhere, anywhere chance to roam, it keeps me all the way, each day, so for, so for my master's sake, my Cross I'll meekly, meekly bear. labor, let us go to God in prayer. And as we do so, I'm going to ask Brother Rich if you can turn off the, the air there. Thank you. Let us pray together. Gracious, kind, and loving Father, hallowed be your name in all the earth. Father, we come and we are grateful and thankful for who you are, not because of all that you've already done, but simply based on who you are, because it's who you are we, that we have our living, our being, in which we move. We thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for the blessed privilege that we have to be called your children. We thank you for such a love, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your eternal Godhead, for your only begotten Son, our Lord, our Redeemer, our Savior, Christ Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Comforter, the Helper, the Seal of our Redemption, the Holy Spirit. We pray right now as we look into your word, Father, as we continue the theme from this morning of being transformed, 
we pray that you would help us not to be conformed to this world, but help us each and every day that we might be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And as we look specifically tonight, Father, we ask your help because we know that without you, we can do nothing. So help us, help us to be prepared to make a clean break today. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your goodness. And we pray especially for anyone among us who has yet to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may those of us who have obeyed, may we never grow complacent, but may we ever continue diligently to seek you, Heavenly Father, and to cultivate and develop a more personal, intimate relationship with you. For it's in Christ's name we do pray and give thanks and ask it all. Amen. Amen. This morning's message by Brother Barry comes from uh, the theme of our uh, singles workshop throughout the weekend, and we were thoroughly blessed uh, with uh, the words that were spoken throughout the weekend at the singles uh, workshop on Friday and Saturday. Uh, the theme, again, bring, being singularly working with purpose for the Lord. And as Brother Barry pointed out, the word singular uh, has a, 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 a biblical uh, focus more on what we intended for it to be. We were not just speaking uh, in relations to the season of our lives as being singles, uh, but more importantly, this word biblically means, spiritually means, uniquely. And that's something that as saints we all have in common, that in this world, we as those who belong to Christ Jesus, we have a unique work we have a unique service from all the people in the world. We have the blessed privilege to serve the one and true living God. Whether we're single, whether we're married, whether whatever season of life that we're in, we have the blessed privilege to serve God. And again, it is singularly working, notice, with purpose for the Lord. So understand when we speak about working and serving the Lord with purpose, understand that we're not just serving God in any way that we see fit. We're serving him with a purpose. Purpose here means the express reason, the express intent it is the express goal and aim for which something or someone, uh, which something is done or for which someone is created and exists. Spiritually, it speaks to intention. It speaks to objective. It speaks to a designed end to be attained, which God himself has divinely and providentially appointed for us. In other words, you and I as children of the most high God, not only are we assigned to serve and worship God, but we're assigned to serve and worship God, notice, with a purpose. Is that all right? And this is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and the verse 24 and again in 26 and 27, Paul says, you know that many runners enter into a race and only one of them wins the prize. So run to win. Is that all right? Run to win. No one enters into a race to run to lose. Amen, somebody. You and I didn't get into this Christian race so that we can, in the end, lose our soul salvation. We got into it with the express intent to make heaven our home. Amen, somebody? Is that all right? Notice verse 26 and 27, he says, So I run, notice, with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. 
Lord, have mercy, how terrible it would be for you and I to have served God and worshiped God all these years and to encourage others and our families, our friends, our co-workers, and then we wind up being the ones who lose our own souls. Is that all right? You see, as we talk about purpose, this is important, and I'm going to be try to be as brief as I can tonight. It's important because one of the easiest things, one of the easiest sins and greatest issues and obstacles facing the church to this purpose and working and serving the Lord with purpose, one of the greatest obstacles is that of conformity. Conforming with the majority, conforming to the ways of the world. And I understand that this is the case for all of us, and most especially as we focus this weekend for those who are in a season of being single, with all of the stigma and issues which plague them on a daily basis. And notice, both inside and outside of the church. Amen, somebody. Because it's so easy to, to give in when we talk about conformity. It's so easy to give in to social pressures of this life, to conform, to want to blend in. However, it's not so easy to stand out and to be different, which is what we as children of the Most High God are called and commanded to do. You see, even in the very midst of a world and society where seemingly majority rules, and even in the church of our Lord where seemingly at times the majority are not who they claim to be. Amen, somebody. But we must always recognize and understand and remember that the majority, get this now, the majority is not the authority. Is that all right? The majority is not the authority. The majority does not set the standard, amen, for the morality or anything else in our lives as children of God. God alone, get this, God alone is the sovereign standard. God alone is the lawgiver. God alone is the judge. Even, notice, even though we live in a world of wickedness around us, God is still in control. He's still the standard. He's still the lawgiver. He's still the judge. Even in the midst in the kingdom of men, God is still the standard. Daniel chapter 4, the verses 25. Daniel speaking to a man named Nebuchadnezzar, who was king at the time, who, who thought, amen, somebody, that he was all that. Is that all right? I, I, I need to put it in terms to where we can understand it. He, he thought that the world revolved around him. And if we're not careful, we can think sometimes that the world revolves around us. Daniel 4.25, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, they shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. In other words, he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, God is going to allow for you to lose your mind. Is, is that all right? And sometimes in order for us to get a message from God, sometimes, sometimes God has to allow us to go through some things in our life that will get our attention. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over you. Notice why. Till you know. King Nebuchadnezzar, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Now notice, after that happened, because when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. After that happened to King Nebuchadnezzar, look at his response in Daniel chapter 4, in the verses 34 and 35. King Nebuchadnezzar says this, after this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised 
and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. Notice what he's come to recognize now. And it's, uh, and it's something that we, when God gets our attention to things that we can now see, he says his rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? None of us can question God. None of us can give him any counsel on what he's doing. Because sometimes we're going through life, amen, somebody. All right? Sometimes we're going through life, and, and sometimes we even get to a point where we ask God, do you, do you know what you're doing? Are we getting this? And if we don't say it, we think it. Amen, somebody. You see, conformity, I want you to get this now, as we hasten. Conformity will always be a great obstacle to overcome for those of us who have yet to find our true identity. Think about that. Conformity will always be a great obstacle to overcome for those of us who have yet to discover our true identity. Many of us are still trying to find an identity in the things of this life. But we were not created after the image of the things in this life, but we were created in the image of God. Is that all right? We spend so many years attempting to identify ourselves with what the world says we ought to be in order to fit in. And as we talked about this this weekend with the singles, in order not to be stigmatized. Instead of accepting and embracing who we truly are. And that's Christ-likeness. To be like Christ in nature and life and character. And that's hard because when we do that, we're going to stick out in this world like a sore thumb. And we're not going to fit in. We're not going to blend in. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? And this is why we're encouraged in Colossians chapter 3. In the verses 1 through 4, the word of God says this. Paul says this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your heart, set your mind on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Notice what he says. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on the things here on earth. Amen, somebody. For you died. We talked about that this morning. Brother Barry pointed out. We, we, the old me died. Is that all right? In baptism, the old me died. But, but, but the old man always is trying to be resurrected. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? We, we all have a Michael Myers who's always trying to get up. Is that all right? And we have to kill him. We have to kill her every day. Are we getting this? He says, for you died to this life and your real life, your real life, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Notice this. And when Christ, verse 4, and when Christ, who is your life? You see, sometimes even as children of God, we go around saying uh, my spiritual life and my personal life. No, Christ is my life. I no longer have a personal life. Amen, somebody. I'm married to him. I'm in a covenant relationship with him. I no longer belong to myself. He's my true identity. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. Amen, somebody. But understand this. Don't think for one second that you'll share in his glory if you in this life don't share in his story. So notice again, 
as we hasten. Romans 12, in the verses 1 and 2, real quick. Romans 12, in the verses 1 and 2. Brother Barry did a wonderful job this morning breaking this verse down, exegeting this verse, and helping us to better understand. Amen. Paul says, I beseech you, he's given a summary of the first 11 chapters of Romans, talking to both Jews and Gentiles who are now a part of one congregation. Amen. I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Amen, somebody. Remember, he pointed out this morning in the Old Testament, they gave what? Dead sacrifices. But now in the Christian dispensation, we offer our lives as a living sacrifice. Is that all right? Holy, acceptable to God. In other words, guess what? Our lives that we dedicate and offer to God on a daily basis, amen, somebody, can't be blemished. We can't offer God something raggedy and left over. Is that all right? Are we getting this? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Understand again, I'm not going to uh, go over all that Brother Barry went over today. I'm not going to do that for time's sake. I just want to focus on this word conformed, okay? Conformed, again, properly refers to the way of life, behavior, attitudes, and thinking, which are in accordance and in compliance with the socially accepted standards of this world. So when he says, be not conformed to this world or to this age, he's saying, I, I don't want you no longer to fashion yourself, no longer to pattern yourself, no longer to mold yourself after the socially accepted standards of this world. Is that all right? Because you and I know if you've lived any years in this life, each year the socially accepted standards change. Right. Right. This year this is accepted. Next year something else will be accepted. But Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever, amen, we have to hold to his standards no matter what the world is saying. No matter if the world comes down us and say, well, you shouldn't feel that way. That's a hateful attitude. You should accept this. You should compromise. We still have to hold on to the truth. No matter how people look at us. You see, we're actually getting back to the times of the judges. Where people are doing what's right in their own sight. We live in an age and in a society today that calls good evil and evil good. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Listen. This word conforms spiritually and implies not only following but copying and assimilating to the same pattern, model, fashion, and mold of another. Amen, somebody. So understand then, I, I want to finish with this. Understand, it's hard. It's hard not to be conformed to something that you and I have not yet truly become shocked, appalled, and vexed by. Y'all ain't get that. It's hard not to be conformed to something that doesn't bother you. Are y'all getting this? I want you to look with me in 2 Peter as we work to our conclusion. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start with 
verse number four. Second Peter chapter two, beginning with verse number four. And again, let me let me repeat what I just said. It's hard not to be conformed, not to pattern yourself, not to fashion to yourself, fashion yourself after something that has not truly uh, become shocking and appalling and vexing to you. Are y'all getting that? Second Peter chapter two, starting with verse four, if you haven't said amen. This is Paul or Peter. He's speaking about the fact that there will be false teachers in the latter times. Amen. Verse four, he says, for God did not spare. And he's now talking about the justice of God, because we look at our world, we look at our society and we look at how it seemingly looks to us, how evil people prosper. You ever notice that? It's amazing how evil people prosper. Seemingly nothing happens to evil people. Amen. They live a long life. They live a long life. Amen, somebody. Amen. He says, for God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into Hades or hell in the gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and seven others in his family. You see, there's no number that God has to save. Amen, somebody. Sometimes we think that God has to save at least uh, five million, ten million. God doesn't have to save anybody who's not faithful and obedient to him. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. And guess what? You and I ought to be warned in the world too. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. Amen. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. You see, there's a lot of people walking the face of this earth right now who have no idea, and some who do have an idea, but they want to forget that God once destroyed this life, life on this earth by a flood. Amen, somebody. And Peter talks about it in 2 Peter chapter 1, how they willingly are ignorant of the fact that God once destroyed this world. Is that all right? And the next time it won't be by water, but the next time it'll be by fire. Are oh, we getting this? But my focus to close is on verses 7 and 8. Notice verses 7 and 8. And delivered or rescued righteous Lot who was oppressed. Did y'all get that? Remember I said earlier, I just said it's hard not to be conformed to that which you and I have not yet truly become shocked, appalled, or vexed by. It's hard not to be conformed to something that doesn't bother you. Is that all right? So he says in verse number seven again, and delivered or rescued righteous Lot who was oppressed. Some of your translations may use the word vexed, which means to be sorely troubled, afflicted, distressed, exhausted, and worn out by all of the evil and wickedness that surrounds you. And delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed or vexed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing. Did y'all get that? Day to day by seeing and hearing, by seeing and hearing, by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds, their immoral and evil actions. You see, today we have become so hardened in a sense, so desensitized by all that surrounds us. Even to a point where uh, we can know our neighbors and if our neighbors, if our neighbor kills their spouse or something like that, it, it, it may not even affect us because we're so used to people doing evil things. There was a story 
over the past year where a person got mad at a neighbor for shoveling snow in their yard and shot and killed them for snow. What kind of world are we living in? Is that all right? We've become so hard and so desensitized by all that surrounds us, our world, our, soci our society, and even in entertainment. Amen? Even in entertainment. Amen? Even in entertainment. Amen? And watch this. Even in our very own associations, both inside and outside the church, that we're no longer shocked or repulsed or vexed by sin. In a sense, we've become numb. Sometimes, amen, sometimes you and I can be around fellow, fellow saints, fellow Christians, and we can hear things and see things that we don't even see in the world. Therefore, when we talk about this passage of scripture, Lot was tormented by this. He was tormented by what he heard and saw, notice, day after day after day after day. So I ask you this question. How about you? How about you? Are you tormented by what you see in here? Day after day after day after day? Are you vexed? Are you oppressed? Are you hurt within your soul by what you hear and see every day? But watch this. Not just in the world because sinners do what they do. They sin. Are you tormented by what you see in the church? See. Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, starting with verse number 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be difficult times. Amen, somebody. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, amen, somebody, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good? They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride. Notice this. And love pleasure rather than God. Notice verse 5. They will act religious. King James says, a form of godliness. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Notice the admonition. Stay away from people like that. Stay away. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. Stay away from people like that. This is what the Lord is telling us to do. Not because we're goody two-shoes, not because we think we're better than somebody, amen, somebody, but because this is what the Lord has said. Stay away from people like that. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes, who win the confidence of a vulnerable woman, vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Why? Such women are forever following new teachings, but are never able to come and understand the truth. Amen. In other words, these are, 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 are shysters. They always seek to be, they prey on vulnerable women to win their confidence. 
because they can use those vulnerable women to promote their foolishness. Are we getting this? These teachers oppose the truth. Just as James, Jannes, and Jambres opposed Moses, you find that in Exodus 7 and verse 11. Yeah. These were the magicians that Pharaoh called when Aaron put down his rod and it became a snake. So Pharaoh said, I got some people too that can do the same thing. And today we still live in a world, amen, somebody that people are still trying to do and copy what God does. Are we getting this? They have depraved minds. Notice this. And a counterfeit faith. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are. Just as with Jannies and Jambres. What's the point? The point is even in the midst of vile sins and wickedness. We, we, just as Lot, must keep ourselves separated. This is what the Lord expects of his people, even in an ungodly world. And God will deliver and rescue us. And you say, well, what do you mean by keeping yourself separated from partaking, from participating in the same riot as they do? Amen, somebody. We're not talking about, well, I, I got to quit my job because I'm working with sinners. If that's the case, we all need to move to Mars. <laughs> Amen. Me and my wife are still trying to uh, look for a place on Mars right now. <laughs> Amen. You see, the point is this. Watch this. We don't have to be a slave of the society and environment in which we live. We don't have to be a slave to this environment. But just as Lot, here's the point. We must be prepared. We must be prepared. We must be prepared. And we must be willing to make a clean break away from our environment. We must always be prepared, as much as we may not want to do so, to leave it forever. Now, this is about to get tough, y'all. It was because she was not prepared to make a clean break away from her environment that Lot's wife perished for looking back. It was because she was not prepared to make a clean break from it. Amen, somebody. And the point is, if we in our families, with our friends, our associations, in our workplace, in our living area, in our communities, and yes, and yes, and yes, even in some congregations of the Lord's church, we find that we cannot stay because it's too full of wickedness. Going away from the doctrine, going away from the truth. We find ourselves in that situation, then we need to love God enough to be prepared to make a clean break. And don't look back. We must be prepared and willing to make a clean break away. Love God enough. Otherwise, otherwise, we can very well lose our souls. I've said enough. Are you prepared to make a clean break? Amen, somebody. Are you prepared to make a clean break? And I want to leave you with this thought from verse number 9 in 2 Peter chapter 2. As God's people, we never have to worry about God's pronouncement of judgment on the wicked. Let me bring it home to us. If God judges the United States of America, amen, somebody, 
he will still protect us as his people. We don't ever have to worry about God's condemnation on the wicked as long as we stay faithful and true to him. Look at what it says. Verse 9 says, then in light of the fact that all of this is true, be sure, be sure, be sure that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So that says, in essence, God is able to rescue us. He's able to deliver us. But not only does, is he able, but he alone knows and understands the best way in which it's supposed to be done. Stop trying to save yourself. God knows how to rescue you and, and I, to deliver us, to preserve us from all this wickedness around us. Amen, somebody. And he also knows how to reserve, reserve the unrighteous. In other words, sometimes we think people are just at large. We, we, we sometimes just, you know, get upset and frustrated because we think people are getting away with something. They will never get away from it from God. And understand, vengeance is his. That's his business. Leave it to him. Stop trying to get even with people. You will drive yourself crazy. Stop trying to pay people back. Stop trying to give people a piece of your mind. Keep your mind. You need all the mind you can get. Leave that with God. Amen, somebody. I said enough again for the second time. If there's anyone here tonight who's not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's no greater decision, no, there's no and more important decision that you can make than to give your life to Christ. You say, well, how do you do that? You've heard the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. God gives us faith through the preaching and teaching of his word. We have to couple that, what God gives us by faith, we have to couple that with our belief. Do we believe it? And in particular, do we believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Once we believe that, are we willing to turn away, as we talked about tonight, not being conformed to this world? Are you ready right now today to make up your mind that I want to follow the Lord? I no longer want to live the life that I was living. Make your mind up. And if you're willing to do that, then we have to confess before men and women that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10, for confession is made unto salvation. You're on your way. You're not there yet. As Brother Barry pointed out this morning, the only thing in the scriptures that gives us a, a explicit example of being into Christ and putting on Christ is baptism. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. That's how we become children of God. That's when we have our status changed. Amen, somebody. For you are all the children of God. How? By faith. In Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized, notice, notice, into Christ, have put on Christ. Have put on Christ. And as was pointed out earlier, and I'll reiterate it right now. Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to the church. The church. Ecclesia, the spiritual called out. Amen. Amen, somebody. It's not a place. It's not a building. It's the spiritual called out. The body of Christ, of which Jesus Christ is the head. The body of Christ. The church of Christ. There's no other church you'll find in this scripture, in the New Testament, other than the church of Christ. Not a Catholic church. Not a Baptist church. Not an Episcopalian church. Not a Jehovah's Witness church. They were not there. They're too late, and we're not trying to be insensitive. We're just trying to state the facts. 
Jesus gave his life for the church, his bride. And watch this. When he comes back, he's coming back for his church, his blood-bought church. Amen, somebody. There's, there's a lot of people looking for Christ. That he ain't coming for them. And guess what? We, we need not laugh at that. We need to help them to see that. Just like somebody helped you to see. Because truth be told, some of us was in denominations too. We wasn't always in here. We didn't always know the truth. And we're still learning. God is still patient with us. He's still long-suffering us, with us. He's still putting up with us. And we know better. How much more terrible would it be for us in the day of judgment if we don't get it right? Consider where you are as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement.